we were inspired this morning to stand through all of the worship. And I know that that blesses our Lord God. Now, conflict is something every one of us experiences. According to a Pew Research Center survey, one out of six people are involved in unresolved conflict with someone. And that might mean four or five or six in this room. But don't ever think that I am targeting any of you <laughs> with the messages I bring. You can be assured of it because you know what's on the next page. I teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. But open your heart to see if God might be speaking to you in this message this morning. Now, the National Health Institute says ongoing conflict causes anxiety, stress, insomnia, and depression. And conflict causes 541 billion, that's with a B, a year in medical, mental health costs, job turnover, absenteeism, and lost productivity. However, as Christians, we should be motivated to resolve conflict by this important truth. Listen now, as Charles Stanley would say, listen, if we as sinners can be reconciled to a most holy God, with whom we were once enemies, how can we not be reconciled with other people who are only a little more sinful than we are? And because we've experienced the grace of God, we are enabled by His life-changing power to resolve conflict when we observe and practice God's instructions. This morning, we will look at Jacob's reconciliation with Esau. And I'll finish with three steps we can take to deal with long-term conflict. Put them on the board, Ron, please. Three steps to peace are to forgive the offender, face fear, and fix our eyes on Jesus. Three F's for those of you who like alliteration. Now in Genesis 28, verses 13 through 15, we read that the Lord stood and said to Jacob, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south, and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's us. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Which today means bringing Jacob back to this land with God present with him to enable him to do something that he couldn't do in his own strength. At Bethel, God had told Jacob that he would bring him back. Now, 21 years later, Jacob is camped out at Peniel, about 43 miles away. Ron, you got a map of that? Oh, I forgot my laser. I, yeah, I was given a laser just to show this, but you can follow me. 
Jacob is making his way from Haran in the, thank you, Ron, in the northeast down to Peniel. And these are the areas where he camped. We'll talk about Succoth. And eventually he'll get to Shechem, which you see is across the Jordan River and into the land of Canaan, which God had promised to him. Now, you see where Bethel is. That's where God had promised to bring back Jacob. Well, he doesn't get there quite yet. But that's not the message for today. Now, back in Canaan where Isaac settled, Jacob had taken, you remember, both the birthright and the blessing of his older brother Esau by deception. And God had said that the older that would be Esau would serve the younger, Jacob. But Jacob was impatient and did things his own way. Esau was enraged and was overheard saying that he planned to kill Jacob. So Jacob fled from Esau and worked for his uncle Laban in Haran, where Laban deceived him and gave him a dose of his own medicine for seven years, then seven more years, to pay a dowry for Rachel, whom he really wanted, and then six more years for herds and flocks of his own, so he could be independent. Then God told him to return to Canaan. And he fled from Laban. But Laban caught up with him and threatened to take everything he had. But God warned Laban in a dream not to harm Jacob. Now, Jacob should have learned something from this. As Jacob makes his way southwest toward Canaan, he fears he will run into Esau, who was the prince of desert marauders east of the Jordan River. In chapter 32, we read about how Jacob sent messengers with gifts ahead of him to Esau in an attempt to appease him. The messengers met Esau and returned with a report that Esau was coming with 400 men and no friendly dinner invitation. So Jacob, it says, was greatly afraid and distressed. Now that night, Jacob sent all his servants, animals, wives, and children across the Jabbok River toward Esau. <laughs> but Jacob himself went back on the north side across J the Jabbok alone. And there he was confronted by the angel of the Lord for his cowardice and lack of faith. Jacob was not quick to surrender. And he wrestled with the angel of the Lord until dawn. I imagine God was not happy that after he had protected Jacob from Laban, that now Jacob was afraid of Esau. Come on, guy, let's get this. Worse than being afraid, Jacob put everyone else in danger between him and Esau, and he stayed behind. Now in this wrestling match, you remember, God could have destroyed Jacob. He could have rendered him helpless by not only dislocating one hip, but dislocating the other hip and both shoulders. Instead, I believe God was patient with Jacob, waiting for him to exhaust himself and surrender. And so it is with us. Verse 28 actually says that Jacob prevailed, remember that? But only because God let him prevail after he opposed him. 
Then God blessed Jacob with the name change from Jacob to Israel. Remember? Israel means wrestles with God. And this should remind Jacob for the rest of his life about the time he wrestled with God. God let him live. And this is a turning point in his life. But like for many of us, a turning point starts us in the right direction, but we sometimes take detours. But we can find our way as we follow God. A point where God gives Jacob courage to face his fear instead of flee is coming in the message today. We read in James 1 and Romans 5 about how facing trials strengthens our faith. We usually don't grow in faith when we're just lackadaisical about everything's just going along on autopilot. No, it's in the trenches, in the valleys where we wrestle and our faith is strengthened by exercising it to believe God's promise that he loves us and will not leave us or forsake us. Now, all of that was in case you missed last week. In chapter 33, we'll see Jacob act in faith instead of fear as he faces Esau. And we'll also learn some lessons about the importance of humility in reconciliation as a path to peace in our lives. Now, some years ago, when Cheryl and I lived in Woodland Park, we had a conflict with a tenant in our rental property, which we don't have anymore, thank God. Instead of complying with the rental agreement, the tenants gave me notice on the last day of the month when the next month's rent was due that they were not going to pay the next month's rent because they were moving out and that we could just keep their deposit, which, by the way, was only one quarter of the rent. They said we could just keep that and that should take care of everything until I inspected the house. Well, they ended up staying all month. And when I inspected it, there were holes in the wall, torn window coverings, stained carpet, and one room painted all black. Imagine how much paint that took. I sent them a bill for the cost of damage plus the extra month of, of uh, occupancy they had. Now, there could have been a late fee also, but in addition, we'd be losing rent for another month, uh, during which time I had to clean it up and do repairs and get a new renter. So altogether, we probably lost $2,000, and in the 80s, that was a lot of money, wasn't it? Now, the old tenants, they said they couldn't pay because they had to pay deposits on the new place. And we were, we were old uh, history. I reminded them that they signed a contract and were liable. And they threatened to file a complaint against me for harassment. <laughs> now, I'm a generous person, but I hate to be cheated. I'd rather give willingly out of the joy of doing so. Now, this is a case I'm sure I could have won. And at one time, I wanted to be a lawyer. God had different plans for me. I <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. But this was robbing me of sleep and peace. These people actually said that they were Christians and that a brother shouldn't take another brother to court. I had no peace about this. But they were right about what the Word of God said in the book of 1 Corinthians. It is chapter 6, not 7. I correct myself from Bible study. Chapter 6, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians. 
Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Hmm. So there I was with a dilemma. And God prompted me to forgive them. Now, you can make your own applications through this message, and I'll try to help you with a three-step action plan at the end. Let's start into chapter 33, verse 1. Now Esau lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him were 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. And he put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. When Jacob sees Esau coming, he puts his wives and children in order according to his love for them, least first and most loved in the back. Now, you know, there had already been conflict between Jacob's wives. Uh, this only made matters worse. He put Rachel and Joseph last to be in the safest place. But now, instead of him hiding in the rear with Rachel and Joseph, Jacob crosses over before them. He steps up to show courage that he didn't have before. As Charles Stanley would say. Now listen. Verse 3. Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Jacob approaches Esau with deference and humility. It was the custom in those days when entering the court of a, a ruler to bow seven times when approaching. Indeed, Esau had become a prince of the desert, a formidable personality. He ruled the land of Edom. He was one to be feared aside from the possibility that he might take revenge for Jacob's offense toward him in the way that he took his birthright and his blessing, even though God had told him it would be his. But Jacob's, Esau's greeting to Jacob was a total surprise. Read verse 4. Esau ran to him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Here, is reconciliation. It didn't even have to go another step. It is a reconciliation that exceeds Jacob's expectations. The last words that Jacob heard 21 years before in Canaan from Esau were murderous threats. So what caused Esau's heart to change? <laughs> I believe it was God's doing. God softened Esau's heart, perhaps even after Jacob had sent his messengers and the 550 animals as a gift and restitution for Esau's expected anger. Now we know God warned Laban in a dream to do no harm to Jacob. Perhaps God warmed Esau's heart and melted his anger. We never know what God might be doing with other people, even people who don't believe in him. Even people who feel very justified in their anger toward us. But let's read on. Verse 5. And he lifted his eyes and saw the women and children, Esau did, and said, Who are these with you? So he said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. 
Then the maidservants came near, they and their children, and bowed down. And Leah also came near with her children, and they bowed down. And afterward, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. Jacob gives testimony to how God has blessed him. And all of his family show respect to Esau, which tells us that Jacob was not bad-mouthing Esau toward them. Verse 8. Then Esau said, What do you mean by all this company, the 550 animals that he'd already sent? And he said, Jacob said, These are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, No, please, if I have now found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand, inasmuch as I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. Please take my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. So Jacob urged him, and Esau took it. Now, two things are noteworthy here. First, gift giving in that culture was a gesture of friendship. Now, originally, Jacob offered all these animals to Esau as restitution. But now, with Esau's friendly greeting, it seemed unnecessary. But Jacob urged Esau to accept the gift now as a gesture of friendship rather than restitution. In that culture, to reject a gift offered was an offense and a rejection of friendship. So Esau accepts. The second point is that both Esau and Jacob say, they have enough. Now, it doesn't appear this way, but let me tell you that the word Jacob uses that is translated enough is actually a different word than the one used about Jacob. The one used, uh, Esau, the one that's used for Jacob means all, not just enough. Now, at this point in his faith journey, having all his needs makes it possible for him to be generous. Luke 6.38 says, Give, and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. And so we have all that we need from our Heavenly Father and are able in the same way to give. This is important because Jacob had learned to be content with what God had provided. Having this attitude within us is important in reconciliation. Jacob could give to Esau in restitution and friendship without it feeling like a loss because he knew God's blessing was on him. He knew that, and he had seen that God provided him all of his needs. And furthermore, that reconciliation was worth the sacrifice for peace. Verse 12. Then Esau said, Let us take our journey. Let us. Let us go, and I will go before you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are weak, and the flocks and herds which are nursing are with me. And if the men should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die. Please let my Lord go on ahead before his servant. I will lead on slowly at a pace which the livestock that go before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord in Seir. And Esau said, 
Now, let me leave with you instead some of the men who are with me. But Jacob said, Oh, no, no, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord and don't bother. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. Esau seems to be expecting that Jacob is going to continue with him to Seir. And Jacob doesn't correct him. Seir is in Edom on the south and west of the, or excuse me, south and east of the Dead Sea and the Jordan River. But God had told Jacob to return to Canaan. So Jacob makes an excuse to travel separately from Esau. And next, Esau offers to assign some of his men as an escort to protect Jacob and his people. Now, Jacob's real intentions are not to follow Esau, but to go northwest back toward Canaan. Why didn't he just tell Esau? Has that ever happened to us? We don't want to mess up a good thing? Well, he might not have wanted to hurt Esau's feelings after such a warm reunion. He might not have been able to say, thanks, but no thanks. Furthermore, he might not have wanted to tell Esau that he wanted to return to the inheritance that he had stolen from him, if you remember. But instead of going directly to Canaan, Jacob makes a lengthy stop at Succoth. In 31.13, God had told Jacob to leave Haran and return to the land of his family. But he stopped short. Do we ever stop short of complete obedience? Yeah, yeah, I'm going that direction, God, and getting comfortable right where we are instead of finishing. Yeah, okay, thank you. At least I'm not, at least I'm seeing eyeballs with those nods. That's good. So even though Jacob is learning to trust and obey God, he has a minor relapse here that will lead to trouble that you'll read about next week. Now, verse 17 says, Jacob journeyed to Succoth, built himself a house, and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth. Succoth, brothers and sisters, is on the east side of the Jordan River, outside of Canaan. So what's this? Building houses. Succoth means booths and shelters. In other words, a more permanent dwelling than a tent. In building a house and stables, it seemed that Jacob's intended to stay for a while in Succoth. And some length of time must have passed before Jacob gets moving again to Canaan. Verse 18, Then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem. This is like an epilogue. Some time has passed. Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padam Aram, and he pitched his tent before the city, and he bought the parcel of land where he pitched his tent from the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. There he erected an altar and called it El Elohi Israel. These verses are sort of a summary epilogue to Jacob's 21-year sojourn from Canaan to Hanan, Haram, and back again. Now, although Jacob is now in the land of Canaan, he's still not all the way into Bethel, which is the land of his family that God had told him to return to about 20 more miles. Now, there's no indication that Jacob had bought the land where he had built the house in, in Succoth, but now he does buy land and erects an altar 
in Shechem. Jacob called the place of the altar God, the God of Israel. Remember, Jacob is now Israel. Jacob had built altars before. Now this practice began when he first fled from Esau and had this dream about the angels going up and down the ladders. And he named the place before Bethel, which means house of God. Now before Jacob gets back to Bethel and his family home, he will experience another conflict and this time with the people of Shechem. Shechem, by the way, means back. And this is a place of backsliding, where Jacob's sons commit a cruel deception that you're going to read about next week. But we'll stop here today. What does God expect from us in a conflict situation. How does he want us to respond? Well, a good place to begin is prayer. Yes, thank you. Then there are three steps to gaining freedom from fear, frustration, and failure. Oh, there's three more F's. And these things often come from conflict. The three steps are to forgive, to face, and to fix our eyes on Jesus. Listen now. Number one, forgiving is the first step to freedom. This is important because when we harbor bitterness and resentment, we can be robbed of the peace Jesus came and promise to put in our hearts. Especially if we obsess about the wrong that we have suffered. And that's why Hebrews 12, 14 through 15 says, pursue peace. Don't expect it to just come to your door. Pursue peace with all people. And holiness without which no one will see the Lord looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God and lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled. Often in conflict, there's sin abounds. Yeah. And this might require humbling ourselves. Even if we are the one being wronged, this is important because it takes faith. So like Jacob, we can give glory to God for giving us all we need. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray, Lord, forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. For if we forgive men their trespasses, our Heavenly Father will also forgive us. Now, it sounds conditional, but God's forgiveness through Christ is unconditional. But our experience of it is conditional on our willingness to be forgiving in the same example as He set for us. Now, you remember my story last week about the conflict I had with the boss? I'll finish it this week. When he asked me to do something unethical, I refused and he threatened to fire me if I didn't comply, and I abruptly quit to escape conflict instead of confronting it with humility and faith. But bitterness robbed me of sleep and peace. Well, he may have been just fine about that, but I was the one suffering. But God moved me to forgive him over time 
And sometime I told you later that when I saw this boss in the department store, and he eventually saw me approaching, he stepped back and flinched because he expected me to punch him in the face. God moved me to ask his forgiveness for walking out on him and not trying to resolve the issue. It wasn't my fault to begin with, but guess what? I sinned in acting self-righteously toward him. Well, he could have rejected it, but I didn't do all I could have done to seek reconciliation. I offended him with my self-righteousness. So I had to ask his forgiveness. In order to forgive someone else, we might first need to ask God to show us our fault. Conflict usually has two sides. Well, I didn't go back to work for him. God didn't require that of me. But we were reconciled and there was no more bitterness that defiled me. After reconciling with Jacob, with Esau, I mean, Jacob didn't go back with Esau to Edom. God didn't require of him. Reconciling doesn't mean that we have to go back to the way things were before. We don't have to go back to being with the other person. Three years ago, my own brother rejected me for no specific reason except our faith, and he cut off all communication. We're reconciled now, but we don't hang out together, and that's okay. There's no bitterness. There's no grudges. And the unpaid debt of our former tenant who cheated us is forgiven and reconciled. God has restored to us more than we have lost. We have all, we have all that we need in Christ. Now, I didn't have to invite the tenant who burned me to move back in. God didn't require that of me. I didn't have to give him a good reference as a landlord because after all, that might cause another landlord to get burned. We reap what we sow, and we're honest about it. But reconciliation might simply mean putting away wrath and forgiving, regardless of fault. Was that just number one? Okay, we'll make it. If you're taking notes, here's the second one. F word is facing fear, the second step to freedom. Now, our natural tendency is what? Fight or flight? Normal? Okay, we've all experienced that. We either fight for our rights or we take flight to safety. It was Jacob's natural tendency to take flight. He could have just turned west before he got to Esau and gone toward Canaan instead of across the Jabbok River. Maybe he would have avoided Esau altogether, but he wouldn't have peace and freedom. He'd still have sleepless nights wondering if some night Esau was going to sneak up on him and kill him. Notice that in all of these steps I'm going to give you, they are active and not passive. We no longer, brothers and sisters, have to live on autopilot according to our natural tendencies. We have alternatives to fight or flight. 1 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things, old things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. Now we walk in the spirit and not in the flesh, as Galatians 5.16 says. So 
so instead of going ahead and doing things our own way according to the natural tendencies of the old self we need to ask God for courage and humility to face fear and seek reconciliation fleeing from or ignoring a conflict doesn't give us freedom and we need God's help to face it now having peace sometimes requires that we take the initiative to reconcile if we flee instead of facing our fears they tend to haunt us Psalm 34 13 says we must seek peace and pursue it Romans 14 19 says let us pursue the things which make for peace notice these are action words directing us to take initiative we may have to confront the source of our conflict with humility and contrition Romans 12 18 says if possible so far as it depends on you be at peace with all men now wouldn't you be willing to show some humility and contrition if it led to peace and freedom from stress anxiety and insomnia that's the blessing that God gave to Jacob after Jacob faced his fear Jesus was very specific when he commanded us to be reconciled listen to Matthew 5 23 and 24 this has universal application if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember your brother has something against you leave your gift before the altar and go your way first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift it doesn't matter if your brother is justified in having something against you if he is then asking forgiveness is appropriate it doesn't matter if you are not at fault it doesn't matter who is at fault all that matters is restoring peace and if it's in within our power to do so God wants us to take initiative now if you are preoccupied distracted or anxious even fearful because someone else feels offended by you and you fear retaliation from them God wants you to do something about it for their sakes as well as your own whether or not they deserve it how about that and such is God's grace to us when we were still enemies we were reconciled to him through the blood of Jesus Christ now why do I emphasize this because if someone has something against you even if you've done nothing wrong you may be robbed of peace and Jesus said in John 14 27 peace I leave with you my peace I give you and in John 16 33 these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace don't let anybody else remove that peace from you by your own response to conflict are you not experiencing peace because of fear or conflict with someone pray and ask God to give you courage and humility to confront the source of your inner turmoil take initiative to pursue peace now we've taken the first two steps forgive and face and there's one more the third step to freedom is to fix our eyes on Jesus 
after forgiving the offender and facing our fear, the last thing, as Hebrews 12, 2 says, is to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. As I mentioned, James 1 and James 5 talk about how trials strengthen our faith to endure and do such things that in our natural selves would be impossible. Psalm 119 in the English Standard Version says, I will meditate on your precepts, O God, and fix my eyes on your ways. Hebrews 3.1 in the NIV says, Fix your thoughts on Jesus. And 1 Chronicles 29 says we should fix our hearts on God's. Pretty comprehensive, right? We fix our eyes, our thoughts, and our hearts on God. And Isaiah 26.3 gives us this promise. God will keep in perfect peace the one whose mind is fixed on him. Do you believe that? It, yeah. If you've experienced that, you know it can be true. Now, there are times when no matter what we do, we cannot resolve a conflict. That's when we give it to God and we leave it there. We have to lay it on the altar and leave it there. First Peter 5.7 says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. God may be working in ways that you don't even know for your good. Remember, God warned Laban not to harm Jacob and he made a treaty with him. And it seems God warmed Esau's heart to forgive Jacob when he saw Jacob's humility and willingness to make a concession that he at that time didn't even need. Now, nothing is too big for God. Philippians 14, excuse me, 4.13 says... We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And while he may be working in others in ways we do not know, <laughs> he may also be working in us to make us more like Christ. So I urge you this morning, if you're suffering stress, anxiety, fear, sleeplessness, or depression, pray and take these three steps. Forgive, face, and fix your eyes on Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, this is such an important instruction from you. We pray that you would apply it to our lives by your Holy Spirit so that it may be accomplished to make us more like you, more like what we see and know in the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask you, Lord, to make us more aware of your grace in our own lives and that while we were still sinners Christ died for us and you took initiative to reconcile us to yourself help us to follow your example and take initiative where you direct us to be reconciled and experience your peace in Jesus name Amen